Hi. Thank you for attending today. I'm Laurie Trungone, the service line leader at Inspira for Women's Health. This Health Bite today is sponsored by Inspira's Spirit of Women program, where we educate the women in our communities in a fun and innovative way. We have a great presentation in store for you today. We're using the On24 platform, which we've used before. So those of you who have been with us know that it has lots of fun bells and whistles for you to play with. So feel free to click around, explore, have some fun with it. Um, move those windows on your screen so that it's comfortable for you to be able to see what you need to see and do what you need to be able to do. At the bottom of your screen, there are multiple engagement tools that you can use. Using the toolbar, you'll be able to download the slides and the other resources that we have there for you. You can view uh, the speaker's bio um, and even register for our next event. As usual, we encourage you to ask questions. And throughout the event, we will have um, poll questions that you we would like you to participate in. When you do ask a question, know that it is can be, if you'd like it to be, anonymous. So feel free to ask whatever is on your mind. This presentation is being recorded, and you will be able to view an on-demand version um, after. So let's get started. Um, it's my privilege to introduce today our speaker, Dr. Peter Senator, who is the Rectal Cancer Program Director at Inspira Health and is the colon, rectal, and general surgeon for Inspira Medical Group. He received his undergraduate degree from Johns Hopkins University with a BA in biology and earned his medical degree from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And he completed his internship and residency at Georgetown University Hospital. He is board certified by the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Colon and Rectal Surgery. He has authored and participated in multiple publications with respect to colon and rectal issues and participated um, and, and has a wealth of knowledge to share with you today. Um, March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, um, and it is our annual celebration observed in the United States during the month of March to increase awareness of colorectal cancer. And we really encourage, it encourages people to have regular screening tests for cancer to improve and save your life. Uh, so just so you know, screening tests are used to, to look for disease when a person doesn't have any symptoms. And when a person does have symptoms, diagnostic tests are used to find the cause of those. And today we're here to talk about colorectal cancer and what we need to do to keep ourselves safe. I hope that you all had the opportunity to see the patient testimonial that we had while you might have been waiting for Laura, who gave her amazing story of how a colonoscopy saved her life. Um, and we'll show you how that can be really important for you today, too. So welcome, Dr. Senator. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lori, and good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. So we'll start off today with a poll question. Uh, we'd like to see uh, what your response to colorectal cancer is as the second leading cause of cancer in the United States. So colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer in the United States, true or false? Colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer in the United States. And we'll see how you do, and then we'll uh, let Dr. Senator show you what that might mean. So let's see. We'll give you a second to get those answers in. Don't see anything just yet, so let me see. Okay, so 80% of you think that that is true and 20% of you think that that is false. So let's have Dr. Senator uh, help us understand if that is true or false and what we should be doing in screening for colorectal cancer. All right. Well, thank you, Laurie. And for those 80% who said true, you're dismissed. Uh, <laughs> I hear the with the 20% who didn't realize that. But in fact, yes, colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer in the United States. It has been for almost my entire career, and it's been a pretty long one. Um, and uh, it's something which, uh, uh, despite the fact that we have made inroads and been decreasing the numbers, it still remains as a number two cancer killer. Um, and the reason why it's such a concern to us is because it is something that is extremely pr uh, treatable, curable, and even preventable. And the reason is because we know that almost all colorectal cancers will begin as benign growths called polyps uh, that uh, form the colon and rectum, and uh, it can take 
up to 10 to 15 years from the time a polyp first develops until it starts to transform towards cancer. So therefore, if we're in there doing these screening tests and we're taking polyps out, we're preventing colon cancers from forming. And if even if we don't prevent it, if we uh, uh, catch colorectal cancer at its earliest stage, over 90% of them are curable uh, with surgery. So it is something, uh, it's a very common disease and it's very treatable and preventable. And that's why a lot of people feel it's one of the most important cancers to be screening for. Um, again, 88% of all cancers, uh, we know that screening does uh, catch these early or prevent and reduces deaths from colorectal cancer. And you can lower your uh, risk for colorectal cancer along with screening by uh, doing a more healthy lifestyle, which we'll talk about later. So what are the causes then of colorectal cancer? Well, the exact cause is unknown. We do know that there are various uh, mutations that will occur in specific genes that can go on the pathway from a normal colon lining to developing cancer. Uh, not everybody follows the same genetic pathway, uh, so it's, it's not clear. We do know that there appear to be factors both related to genetics, as I mentioned, and also lifestyle changes that can impact your risk for colorectal cancer. Uh, we know that uh, people who smoke cigarettes, uh, more sedentary lifestyle, lack of exercise, and overweight, these are things which do seem to be associated with an increased risk for colorectal cancer. And as I said, genetics, these random genetic changes that can occur in the cells lining the colon or rectum, uh, can, there's several different uh, steps along the pathway towards colon cancer that can occur. Is it common? Uh, well, as we said, it's 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 eight percent of all cancers are colorectal. Uh, colorectal. One in twenty Americans, we feel, will develop colorectal cancer at some point in their lifestyle uh, lifetime. Uh, it's uh, the, as I said, it's the second most common uh, cancer killer, but it's actually even the third most common cancer overall. Um, and uh, the American Cancer Society keeps the statistics, and uh, the statistics for 2021, obviously, they're they're projected but they're projecting a total of uh, 149,500 new cases with over 104,000 being colon and over 45,000 being rectal cancer. And they're estimating there'll be almost 53,000 deaths from colorectal cancer. Now, as I said, these numbers are going down compared to prior years and prior times I've given this lecture, but they're still pretty significant and they still rank as number two overall. Wow. So what are the symptoms that maybe we should be aware of so that we can be on top of having the possibility of having colorectal cancer? Well, unfortunately, there is no specific symptom that is that you as pathognomonious or specific for colorectal cancer. Uh, all the symptoms you see there could be a host of other uh, you know, problems with any part of the intestinal tract, uh, change in bowels, uh, blood in the stool, you know, a pain in the abdomen, uh, change in uh, the stool consistency or, or with diarrhea or constipation, nausea, vomiting, unexplained weight gain or weight loss, a loss of energy, fatigue, loss of control or incontinence. It can even be upper intestinal symptoms like heartburn or indigestion or difficulty swallowing. But as we, as Laurie mentioned earlier, we're talking about screening, which means we want to, we want uh, to do this in the absence of symptoms. So uh, the most important thing is to is to not wait for a specific symptom to get screened for colorectal cancer. Um, we, in fact, when we find that when people have symptoms that lead to the diagnosis of colorectal cancer, the, oh, the majority of these people are beyond the point where they can be cured by surgery alone. So it's something that, you know, don't wait for symptoms. Screening is in the absence of symptoms. And that's, I think, the takeaway message. Well, that's a little bit scary, right? So are there risk factors then that we should be aware of? Well, we talked a little bit about the lifestyle and talking about, you know, being overweight, smoking, uh, certain dietary changes, uh, dietary habits. Uh, family history is one of the more important ones when if there's a, a history in your immediate family, meaning father, mother, sister, brother, son, daughter, that does impact significantly your risk for colorectal cancer. Age, we do know as we get older, the risk for colorectal cancer does go up. Uh, having said that, there is no age too young to get colorectal cancer, as we'll talk about a little bit later. I said lifestyle. There are certain hereditary diseases, not just uh, 
um, certain uh, diseases related to the colon, but there are also other types of uh, cancers in other parts of the body that put you at increased risk for colorectal cancer. Um, and race, uh, we do know that the uh, black and African-American population does have a higher risk for colorectal cancer compared to uh, other demographics. We also know that uh, Asian Pacific Islanders tend to have a lower risk of colorectal cancer. But having said that, uh, there are the environmental and dietary factors when Asians and Pacific Islanders uh, come to the United States and live here and adopt a more Western uh, diet, their risk does go up. So then how about prevention? Is there a possibility that we can prevent colorectal cancer? Colorectal cancer? Um, absolutely. And I said the number one way to do that is to get screened. As I talked about, the vast majority of colorectal cancers start out as benign polyps. So by getting screened, getting you know, evaluated, finding these polyps, and then removing them, preventing a colorectal cancer from forming in, in the first place. I mean, otherwise, again, we talked about lifestyle, um, you know, healthy lifestyle choices. Um, those are things that, uh, you know, obviously there's no guarantee that that will prevent it, but watching your weight, maintaining a, a healthy diet, uh, more um, vegetables and fiber, and fewer red meats and fat, regular exercise, avoiding cigarettes, limiting alcohol. But as I said, screening is the major thing. Uh, and uh, it had been, we used to talk about age 50 and over, but uh, three years ago, the American Cancer Society actually lowered their uh, uh, age to begin screening uh, to 45. And so that's really has become, you know, 45 has become the new 50. So we do know from research that screening has caused a reduction in the incidence and deaths from colorectal cancer in the last four decades. But this has been primarily in the older age groups, and both the incidence and death rates have been increasing in younger people, uh, especially under the age of 50. So, so obviously this is why the American Cancer Association changed three years ago. So can you explain to us what that means for us? Absolutely. As I said, we've been monitoring the uh, incidence and the, uh, the mortality or the death rate from colorectal cancer for several uh, decades. And we have found that uh, the, the, uh, as we've been doing more and more screening and trying to get people to adopt it, we have seen a decrease still, as, as I said, number two cancer killer, but we have seen a decrease of a one to two percent a year. Um, but uh, that, again, has been primarily in people 65 and over. And uh, we found that when we look at, and this is going back even six, seven years ago, that when studies were coming out showing that you know, under age 50, the rates have been going up and uh, have been going up every decade, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, um, uh, and the rates have been going up. And so, uh, uh, first of all, in terms of the percentages have been going up. The numbers obviously are relatively small because the vast majority of people are over the age of 45, 50. Uh, but what it, the, the take home message from that is to not to ignore any symptoms of, uh, regardless of your age. Uh, and also to be aware, as we'll talk a little bit about, if there's a family history that uh, you shouldn't wait until you're 45 to begin screening, if you, pro you should probably even begin screening younger than that age. Uh, but we do say ages. 45 to 75 is really sort of the, the prime time when you should be getting screening. Uh, and um, there are different types of screening tests, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. Each have some risks and benefits, and, and they're all based on the type of screening. There are different time intervals that they're felt to be effective for. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about once you hit age 76 that you don't need to be screened. Uh, that's not entirely accurate. Uh, someone who has had uh, polyps or cancers uh, uh, um, that technically they're not being screened, they're having surveillance, or someone who is in a, has a, a significant family history, those are people that probably should still be screened after age 75, again, based sort of on, on, their, on their overall well-being. Um, and so I think uh, it, while, you know, someone who has never has been following screening all along and has never had any polyps, when they hit age 75, 76, you can probably start to relax that people who are in the higher risk categories probably should continue screening. So uh, again, we talked about uh, screening if you're, um, you know, the, the, uh, a, the incidence under age uh, 50. Uh, we said that when people do have certain risk factors, 
that we feel that they should probably be screened earlier than age 45. The American Cancer Society has not made a specific recommendation for that, but many societies, the colorectal society, the gastroenterologists have all felt that there are certain uh, things that would warrant being evaluated sooner. That's if, number one, if you've had a close relative who has had colorectal polyps or colorectal cancer, uh, at a young, especially at a younger age, you should probably start screening at that point. There are certain diseases, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, namely Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis that are associated with uh, an incidence of, uh, in increased incidence of colorectal cancer and you need to be evaluated for that. And then there are a group of uh, uh, genetic syndromes or can uh, uh, hereditary colon cancer syndromes that do have a very significant risk of colorectal cancer. And so if someone in your family has those, or if you've been diagnosed with that, you need to be watched at a much younger age and much closer. There are a number of them. The two main ones you hear about are familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP. Um, and that this is people who will just have sheets and sheets of polyps in their colon and virtually have 100% risk of if they have that for having colon cancer. So with that, it's not a question of if you need surgery, but timing it. And then there is what's called Lynch syndrome. Uh, they still have polyps, but they don't have the sheets of polyps. It appears to, it's a completely different genetic pathway than FAP, uh, but it is another cancer syndrome that there is a significant risk and people need to be watched sooner and uh, more frequently. So let's ask another poll question um, of our audience. Uh, this is a true or false again. Colonoscopy is the only way to screen for colorectal cancer. Colonoscopy is the only way to screen for colorectal cancer. And we'll give you a, a second to, um, to respond, and then we'll see what you think. And then we'll have Dr. Senator give us the answer. False. 100% of the audience thinks false, that colonoscopy is not the only way to screen for colorectal cancer. So what types of tests are available then? Well, there are a number of different types of tests. I mean, I will say colonoscopy has been considered to be the gold standard because it is the most thorough um, examination. But uh, we basically group them into three main categories, or, uh, and that's you know visual examination. We're actually looking at, at, the, uh, at the colon. And that's the colonoscopy, uh, which is a, it's a scope, a uh, digital image scope, which we see the entire lining of the colon. Uh, you go all the way around, uh, and you can uh, not just look, but you can actually remove polyps or do biopsies through the scope. The sigmoidoscopy is a shorter version of that, um, and uh, uh, it, it does see, it goes up uh the left side of the colon, uh, which is where statistically the majority of the colorectal cancers uh, are, are found. So that's why it has been used. Um, it's obviously not as accurate as looking at the entire colon. It misses things on the right side of the colon, but uh, it requires less of a preparation. Um, usually it's a lot faster because it doesn't go as far. It's a little bit less risky. Um, but because of that, it also needs to be done more frequently. Then you have imaging, or the, the radiologists do examinations. Uh, the old tried and true is the barium enema, uh, which uh, puts uh, barium or a contrast uh, material through the colon, and they take images of that. And you can often uh, see polyps, especially if they do what's called an air contrast barium enema, where it's a little barium just coating the surface rather than filling it. And then there's the, uh, the relatively new kit on the block, which is the CT colonography, or some people refer to it as a virtual colonoscopy. And that's using either CAT scans or in some cases MRIs and basically forming a, a topographical map of the colon that you can then scan through uh, and, and it, uh, find little areas that may indicate there are polyps or growths there. Um, then you have stool tests. Um, which uh, the, the, the traditional one was what's called the fecal occult blood test or the guaiac test. Um, th that's a test basically just examining stool and looking for blood. Um, the problem with it is that certain medications and certain foods can cause it to be positive even when there's no blood there. And that's uh, because of that, they've shifted to the FIT or the fecal immunochemical test, which is basically, again, still looking for blood, but doesn't have the same dietary or medication restrictions, so it's a little more sensitive and more specific. And then you've seen the ads on TV for the color guard, the stool DNA test, which is completely different. That's actually looking for shed cells, 
uh, 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 in the stool, which can indicate either benign or cancer. Uh, so it's it's not just specifically for blood, which can be coming from anywhere. And it's been shown in some t- st- uh, studies to be up to over 90% sensitive for this. Uh, so that, that is something that is becoming used more and more frequently. Again, the stool tests, uh, the, the FOBT and the FIT tests, have to be done annually because they're they're not that accurate or sensitive, and then the coal guard is every three years, and then I talk about DNA testing, and that's again if someone has a family history or they have certain characteristics about you know cancers at young ages where you have to be concerned about these certain hereditary cancer syndromes, then there are certain you know, genetic counseling and genetic testing and DNA testing that can be done. So one of the things that I know a lot of people worry about is, you know, are these tests covered by insurance? Well, um, I would say, and I tell people when I've given a a more complete lecture, that uh, there have been various organizations that have examined the insurance coverage across the nation and given very health care grades. And New Jersey is actually, uh, you know, has been getting consistently an A rating in terms of their insurance coverage. And that being said, obviously not you know it's it's not perfect, um, but most insurance plans and Medicare will still at least adhere to the old 50-year uh, age and older. Most are lowering the age to 45 based on the American Cancer Society recommendations. Um, most uh, a lot of times the screen tests will be covered by your health policy without even a deductible or a copay. But the important thing is obviously to check with your insurance plan. Now, the other thing that has uh, helped in New Jersey is what's called the NJC program, which uh, stands for New Jersey Cancer Education and Early Detection. And that's meant for ex- the extremely low income and uh, uh, um, uh, poor populations within uh, New Jersey. Uh, it, it, uh, it's been sort of a ramping up coverage. It started out with cervical and breast and then added colorectal and prostate. And so it's, it's a program that is in place for people with significant financial hardships. Um, where they can get their fit testing done, and then if a fit test comes back positive, then they would be referred for a colonoscopy. So um, that's that's there. Um, I will say again, having said that, insurance is pretty good, and we have the NJC program. People in New Jersey are not taking advantage of it. Uh, when we look at uh, you know uh, the percentage of people at risk who are getting screened, it's under seventy percent. And the NJC program, especially uh, you know, in places like Cumberland County, only about uh, less than 25% of the people who qualify are, are getting are taking advantage of it. So, you know, again, screening is important, but only if it gets done. Right. So the message that we'd like all of you to have is don't let embarrassment keep you from getting the appropriate screening tests, right? We want you to keep a record of any symptoms that you may be experiencing. Remember, symptoms shouldn't be dismissed or ignored just because you're below the screening age. And make sure you ask your doctor how you can reduce your risk for colorectal cancer um, and when you should begin screening. So we'll have now Dr. Senator answer any questions that you may have. And I see we have a couple already. Um, One of them is um, about the non-invasive screenings. Are they as effective um, as some of the more invasive things like colonoscopy, as you mentioned, being gold standard? Um, They're not as sensitive. I mean, that's the, you know, as I said, that's why the colonoscopy is considered the gold standard. Uh, But having said that, you know, colonoscopy is not an innocuous procedure. It does, it's, you know, we are inserting a scope all the way around. It does have risks for that. It does require a complete bowel preparation to see what we're we're doing there. It often requires, in most cases, requires anesthesia, uh, sedation, so we can, uh, so the patient's relaxed enough to do the examination. So that's, I mean, it, it does, uh, have some impact in that regard. And so it's not for everyone. I mean, and, and uh, so that's why uh, a lot of these other tests have been uh, felt to be appropriate. Now, again, if they're not as complete, uh, the accuracy rate is, is a little bit less. Uh, and uh, then uh, as a, as a, uh, a corollary, they also need to be done more frequently uh, because they're not as accurate. And I will say that if any of the non-invasive or the other tests other than colonoscopy comes back positive, the next step is colonoscopy. So that's, you know, uh, colonoscopy, you know, is, is, the, is the, you know, the one thing that would have to be done should any of these other tests uh, uh, demonstrate a problem. 
because we want to be able to visualize it. And other than the sigmoidoscope, no, no, no other study can actually obtain a sample or, or remove uh, a lesion. So the next question is, and, and I think you answered some of this with the fact that not everything is invasive, but um, we have one of the people in our audience is um, afraid of IVs. So is there a way to be screened without having an IV inserted? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the only test that really requires an IV is the colonoscopy. Um, a sigmoidoscopy is, uh, it can even, again, depending how brave you are, I mean, I, for most of my career, we were doing those in the office. Uh, you know, all they require is an, an enema or two beforehand before they come to the office. So it, it can be done without any sedation and without any IV. Um, but certainly the stool tests are just a matter of obtaining the sample. Uh, the uh, the X-ray tests usually do not require an IV because we're not talking about intravenous contrast. We're talking about, uh, you know, in the case of the barium enema, the barium is given in th uh, through the rectum, and then with the uh, virtual colonoscopy, the CT colonography, that that's no contrast at all. So the uh, another question that we have is um, we have a 30-year-old who has colorectal cancer that runs in her family, um, and she wants to know should she get screened now or does she need to wait till she's 45? It would depend upon the ages of the people in her family. Uh, as I said, if, if everyone, uh, it would also depend on how many people, uh, uh, how, what relationship they are to each other. Uh, so that, that it would be something where we'd have to go through the you know the whole family tree and figure figure out. Uh, certainly, if anybody uh, under the age of fifty uh, had uh, had been diagnosed with colorectal cancer, that's significant, um, and and that might indicate that uh, we are dealing with one of the uh, these cancer syndromes, most likely the Lynch syndrome, and it may be something where. She might be referred to a genetic counselor. But I think the first thing is to just go through the, comp the listing of all the people in their family who've had cancer, the ages, the types of cancer, and then uh, figure out what would be the most appropriate time. You know, If she has three or four people in her immediate family, but they're all in their 60s, 70s when they had it, then we would usually start, uh, you know, definitely would want to start uh, by, by 45, maybe even a little bit earlier. Um, but uh, uh, it wouldn't be as concerning as if she had members of her family who were in their 40s when they had their cancer. So it, it, it's hard to answer that question without, you know, a, you know, a complete family tree. Right, right. Um, how about when a benign polyp is found in a colonoscopy on two separate procedures? Do you always go back in five years or can you wait until 10 years? Once you've had a polyp that's a pre again, some Benign polyps are not even precancerous. We call hyperplastic polyps or inflammatory polyps. But if they had a uh, the polyp, you know, a precancerous polyp, they are now at increased risk. So now at that point, it should be done every five years. Uh, depending upon the type of polyp or the number of polyps, it might even be sooner than that. But every five years is once once you've had polyps, you are now at increased risk and need to be watched closer. Right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Senator. This was very informative, and I'm sure our audience really appreciates uh, your time that you took today to educate us. Um, and I'd like to thank our, our team behind the scenes for putting this presentation on for us with you today. So thank you again. Oh, thank you.